Ah, good evening. Uh, welcome to Clink's Bible Study for the 1st of December. Um, just to uh, remind you that uh, next, next Tuesday, God willing, we will be meeting in the church for the Bible study, but um, it still will be recorded as well. Let's just come to God in prayer to begin with. Oh Lord God, we thank and praise you that you are a good, a kind and a loving God, a God who loves to bless us, a God who cares for us far more than we can ever understand. We thank you that, that you, you gave your only begotten Son into this world, that he came and lived that perfect life and died on that cross so that we can have peace with you, so that we can be reconciled to you and have a relationship with you. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for the many things it teaches us, and even from the characters that we read about in your word, that we can learn something from them. Lord, we are conscious at this time there are many people suffering, even within our own fellowship, and we pray that you'll be near to them at this time. Comfort those who mourn, be with those who are unwell or facing many difficulties in their lives. We think of others who um, have big events happening in their life. We think of Will and Beth as they will be moving this week and Cornelia with her operation. Pray you will bless them, Lord, and be with them in their new home. Father, we pray you will be with us now as we look into your word. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I just want to begin with two questions. Firstly, what can we live without? And secondly, what cannot we live without? You know, the government have determined that we can't live without Christmas. And the prospect of a winter without Christmas is as bleak as Narnia, which, uh, as Narnia appeared in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I want to return this evening to the story of Abraham, which I began looking at in August. You may have forgotten about that, but let me first read a brief summary that Stephen gives about Avon's life in Acts chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, and then we'll turn to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And this is Stephen before the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, um, just before he was martyred, giving a history of Israel. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred, and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of, of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And then just turning over to Genesis chapter 12. It's an important uh, chapter in the book of Genesis. An important new um, era begins in Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abraham, that was his name, his name at first, he was called Abraham later, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall 
be blessed. So Abraham, or Abraham as we read there, came to that place in his life, as Jim reminded us on Sunday from, in, from Psalm 90, where in effect he prayed, Lord, teach me to number my days that I may apply my heart to wisdom. He was in the middle of his life at this time. He was willing, he became willing to do without all the pleasures of sin that he could have enjoyed in the city of Ur. It's been described as the New York or the Tokyo of the ancient world. And he was made willing to turn his back on all the idolatry in Ur. We know from archaeology and also from the Bible in Joshua chapter 2, 20, 24 verse 2, that his father's family and possibly Abraham himself served other gods there in Ur. The thing that he had now found that he couldn't live without was a relationship with the living God. And along with that relationship, he could not live without the promises of God, especially the promise of a saviour. So it's appropriate that we consider Abraham as we, in this season of Advent leading up to Christmas. Jesus once said, that Abraham rejoiced to see his day. And Hebrews chapter 11 says that people of faith in the Old Testament saw these promises and they greeted them from afar. So firstly, how does a person come into a relationship with God? Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why we believe it's important to teach children the Bible, to distribute Bibles in schools and hotels and prisons, to give out Christian literature, and to preach regularly the word of God, because God uses that to bring people to faith in him and in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what about Abraham? Even the first five books of the Bible hadn't been written when he was alive. He may have had some knowledge of God through his family because he was a descendant of Noah's son, Shem. Um, but although, as we said, it by his day, the city where he lived was given over to idolatry. However, we read in Acts chapter 7, that the God of glory appeared to him. And this was while he was living in Ur. Perhaps this was none other than the eternal Son of God appearing to him in some form before he came to, came to earth 2,000 years or so later on as a man. There are a number of such appearances in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Genesis. The technical name for them is a theophany or a Christophany. But um, that's how the, the God of glory appeared to him. Perhaps it was like Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter, um, Acts chapter 9. How the Lord Jesus, the risen Christ, suddenly appeared to Saul. And like Saul, Abraham began a relationship with God. And we could say that Behold, he prays, he really prays. Now the evidence of this relationship is that he obeyed God's call to leave behind Sin City, Terah, his father, his wife Sariah, and his nephew Lot came with him. They went up the Euphrates Valley from Ur as far as Haran, and they seemed to settle there. And then that's where Terah, his father, died. But then in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord said to Abraham to leave. And this, this may well have been a renewal of his original call in Ur the Chaldees. So at the age of 75, probably about halfway through his life, they did live a long time in the 
in the book of Genesis, there's some of those uh, men and women. Abraham and Sar Sar Sariah, or Sarah, and, and Lot, his nephew, with all their possessions and all their servants, they set off on the adventure of their lives to go to Canaan, the promised land. One aspect of Abraham's relationship with God was worship. Wherever he went, he set up an altar. In Genesis 12, in verses 7 verse, uh, and verse 8, and then in chapter 13, verse 4, we read Abraham building an altar. In fact, these were probably the only permanent structures that Abraham built because he lived in tents for the rest of his life. And implied in building altars is animal sacrifices, the shedding of an animal's blood. Where this, and this is easy to show because, because many years later, when God said to Abraham to take his son Isaac and go to the mountain of Moriah and there offer him as an offering, it was an ultimate test of his, his faith. Uh, Isaac said to Abraham, when they got so far on the journey, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So obviously Isaac had grown up. It was his expectation that when um, Abraham made an altar, offered things on an altar, there was also a sacrifice on that altar. And throughout the Old Testament, this was the way of coming to God. But it only pointed forwards to that ultimate sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. A hymn writer, Isaac Watts, put it like this. Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give my guilty conscience peace or wash away its stain. But Christ, the heavenly lamb, takes all our sins away a sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. They also said that Abraham couldn't go without God's promises. And that promise in chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, is a foundation promise. It's developed throughout the Old Testament and even in Abraham's life as well. And it finds its, ful its fulfillment in Christ. It's been said that the key to understanding Abraham is the covenant that God made with him. A covenant is another name for a promise. God undertakes to do things for Abraham. It's all on his part. If you notice when we read those verses from uh, Genesis 12, that the I wills that um, God said he would do. I will make you a great nation. That, of course, didn't happen until Moses took the children of Israel out of Egypt. I will bless you and make your name great. Abraham's name is great even today, even amongst Muslim people as well. And you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And then last of all, at the end of verse 3, we read these words. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's here that it points forward to that, to that birthday on, on Christmas Day. As I say, this last part fulfill, uh, finds its fulfillment in Christ. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, and he quotes this verse, and the scripture, the Bible, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. God's salvation was not an afterthought. In fact, it began in an eternity in the past. It was announced in embryo in Genesis Chapter 3, verse 15, after man fell in the Garden of Eden, and it took a further big step forward in Abraham. 
We may look at that in more detail on another occasion, but just for now, let us remember that these promises fueled Abraham's faith. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, Hebrews 11 verse 9 tells us. But secondly, having a relationship with God means that we will grow in faith. We know from the natural world uh, that evidence of a plant being alive is growth. Perhaps it needs to grow beneath the surface, first of all, for roots to develop before shoots will grow above ground. But an evidence of a living relationship with God is spiritual growth. Abraham grew in his trust in God until it reached a height in, in chapter 2 of Genesis, as we referred to before when he offered his son Isaac. But it wasn't all plain sailing. The Bible is honest about its heroes. Abraham, Abraham had his failures. Uh, we considered that last time when he went down into Egypt at the end of chapter 12. Um, but then on his return to the land of Canaan, he was restored in his relationship with God. And there we see a generous hearted man letting Lot choose uh, first where to live because the, the land couldn't sustain both of them and their flocks and herds. <clears throat> and Lot lifted up his eyes and he was attracted to the plain of the Jordan. It was a lush, a lush land. It was like the land of Egypt. Uh, remember, he'd been down to Egypt with Abraham and, and, and he saw that, oh, this would be good to live in, the Jordan Valley. But it was to be a bad choice because it brought him near to Sodom. And Sodom, we are told, was one of the most wickedest places at that time. And then in chapter 14, which is where I want to end this time, he had that lot had actually settled in Sodom. Not only had he pitched his tents near there, but he'd actually moved into the city and settled down there. And yet the New Testament calls Lot a righteous man in 2 Peter chapter 2. But living in Sodom brought him much unhappiness and torment to his soul. And as we shall see, also some danger. Verses 1 to 16 of chapter 14 tells of a war between two alliances of kings. Kings ruled over city-states in those days, not over uh, large areas. And the king of Sodom's alliance rebelled against another alliance of kings, headed by a king called King Chedor Leoma, and to whom they'd been subject for 12 years. King Chedor Leoma's alliance went on the warpath they wreaked havoc through the country, and uh, even archaeology, we're told, has discovered some evidence of this, of this campaign. But eventually they caught up with the king of Sodom, Sodom. they captured him and, and all the booty with him, and including Abraham's lot, uh, Abraham's nephew Lot. And Uncle Abraham heard about this. He didn't say, oh well, it's his fault, he shouldn't have lived in Sodom. Or, well, God is sovereign, he can deal with Lot. And I'm sure Abraham knew something of God's sovereignty, how he had overruled in his circumstances in the land of Egypt. But no, despite that, he went into action. He organized a rescue plan and successfully defeated a larger force of Chedorlaomer and he rescued Lot and all the possessions of the king of Sodom. A sign of Abraham's growth is his relationship with God. And in his relationship with God was his concern for Lot. And I'm sure he must have prayed for Lot. A lot, if you'll excuse the pun. Um, if you, if you just look at the end of James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 how James writes about a person rescuing a sinner from his ways can, can save a person from much, much grief and trouble. And it's after Abraham's victory over the kings 
that he meets a mysterious person called Melchizedek. And I'm just going to read some verses about him from chapter 14, at the end of chapter 14, verses 17 to 20. And after his return, Abraham's return from the defeat of Shedoleoma and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, or Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of, of God Most High, and he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap, or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten, and the share and the share of the men who went with me. Let Anna, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. Various views have been put forward as to who Melchizedek is, uh, but we'll just keep with the scripture. And he appears twice more in the Bible. Firstly, in Psalm 110, Psalm is clearly a mess messianic psalm. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's referred to in the New Testament a number of times. Um, for example, Peter quotes from it on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and he applies it to Jesus. But in verse 4 of this psalm, speaking about Jesus, it says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And the book of Hebrews takes this up in chapter 7. Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem. Salem is the old name for Jerusalem. And it means peace. And who else but the Lord Jesus is King of righteousness and King of peace. Hebrews 7 goes on to show that Melchizedek was like Jesus. He was both a priest and a king. In Old Testament times, a priest could not be king and a king could not be priest. But Melchizedek was both and so is Christ. Let me just read Hebrews 7 verse 25 to you, speaking about Jesus. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. There's no one too hard for Jesus to save. But let's return to Genesis chapter 14, and although Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, nevertheless he blessed him. <clears throat> blessed be Abraham by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. That name, God most high, El Elyon in, in the Hebrew, is one of the names that names of God that occurs in both the Old and New Testament. For example, proud Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel was told by Daniel that God will punish his pride. And Daniel said, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. I wonder if President Trump ought to hear those words. A prophecy against the king of Babylon in Isaiah chapter 14, who said, I will make myself like the Most High. And God said he will be brought down. 
and some even see behind this prophecy, Satan himself. And then in Luke chapter 8, Jesus heals a man called Legion, who was possessed by many devils. The demons recognize who Jesus is. They cried out through the man, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? They recognized Jesus' authority and trembled. And how different the response of a young unmarried woman living in an out-of-the-way place called Nazareth. And the angel Gabriel visited her and said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And we read how the angel says to Mary's relative, Elizabeth, that she has conceived the child in her old age. That, of course, was John the Baptist. And that uh, the angel says, nothing will be impossible with God. We don't worship Mary, but we do learn from her. She was a, a humble disciple of the Lord. And Mary's response was one of willing submission to God. She said, behold, I am. The Lord's, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That's the kind of response I believe Abraham gave. He knew that it wasn't his power that had defeated, defeated the kings. It was the power of the Most High. Abraham knew that his life was in the hands of God, of hands of God Most High. What a wonderful thing it is to know that you are in his hands. I don't think that the God of glory will appear to you in the way he did to Abraham. At the beginning, he was unique. Although I don't want to limit God's power, you sometimes read of uh, Mus or hear about Muslims in, in Muslim lands who don't have access to a Bible, who see visions of Christ. But he may come to you through his word and call you to rise up and follow him if he has not done so um, already in your life. And you may have to do without some things in your life. Abraham wasn't interested in the king of Sodom's bargain who said, you can have the goods and I'll take the people. Abraham wasn't hoodwinked by that. He knew that the king, king of Sodom might later say, well, it's me who made Abraham rich. God wants to bless us, especially with the gift of his salvation. This is how the psalmist puts it in Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord counts whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. God, look, God willing, we will look at that more closely as we consider uh, Genesis chapter 15 next time, which we could say is about the reason for Christmas. Let's just close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the life of Abraham. Help us to learn from this great man's life and how it points to the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask and pray in the name of Jesus, that one who ever lives to intercede for us. Amen.